Hello, I'm Kevin. Uh, I'm Billy. I'm Helen. I'm Seb. Yeah, we're Texas Midnight Runners. In 1980, Dexys Midnight Runners stormed to number one in the charts with the horn-driven sound of Gino. The band's leader, Kevin Rowland, sang like he meant it, and he did. It was me against the world, you know. I mean, I went to see Raging Bull, and I just, that was me. It was life or death, actually. That's what it felt like. It was life or death. For instance, on stage we'd be playing a song and he'd turn around and just spit at the drummer because the drummer was doing a roll instead of sticking to the beat. Two years later, Dexys had a huge international number one with a completely new look, new sound and a new lineup. He couldn't let go enough to to let the band grow at all. It was, you know, it's like had a pathological need to go back to square one. Roland's overwhelming passion not only drove his band away, but left him isolated and damaged. I think I was very lonely, you know, that I approached things with a passion, which is almost too much for me sometimes. The story of Dexys Midnight Runners begins in little-known Birmingham punk band, The Killjoys. After the band's demise, vocalist Kevin Rowland had his first big idea. Along with friend and writing partner Kevin Archer, he formed an eight-piece soul band. With punk and everything, it swept a lot of things away, but I knew that people would want to dance again. With Dexys, we went back to the 60s in a way and just started to rediscover these records, Sam and Dave, you know, Hold On, I'm Coming, we did that in our earliest, in early set. Aretha Frank Franklin's Respect, we listened to that. And these just sounded actually, you know, it's just that thing about what else is going on at the time. They sounded really fresh. We used to go around to youth jazz orchestras and things like that and wait outside and see what, see what they were playing, look through. Two or three, or four, three or four of us maybe, like a press gang, would go around and, and kind of see, look through the windows while they were rehearsing. Oh, that one's playing a tenor, that one's playing a... What's that? That looks like an alto. That's a trumpet. We were like that. We auditioned about 30, 40 people to join initially and we practised about nine hours a day or something like that just to get the sound right. We wanted, you know, a brassy sound, but uh, retaining the aggression and the immediacy that, that uh, the punk rock had. The real attraction for me about them was they were a seven or eight piece band. They weren't a sort of four or five piece band with session men twice their age playing horns. It was something that came out of Birmingham and it couldn't have come from anywhere else. It was very sort of sincere in its sort of uh, appreciation of American R&B, but it was its own thing and it felt for real. It didn't feel like a sort of pastiche sort of thing, you know. It was real. It was for real. There was no mucking around. We were taking everybody on. You know, we were taking everybody on. We not only were going to be a successful group, but we were going to get back at everybody else. Although Dex is seen as having great credibility and integrity, which they did have, they were, to some extent, manufactured. But not by a record company or by any music business entrepreneur but by Kevin Rowland and Kevin Archer. In the early 80s, image was everything. But for Dexys, the look had to serve the proletarian ethos of the band. To me, it was New York Docker. I'd always thought New York Dockers looked good. Often they'd have these kind of chick lumberjack-style jackets on and a polo neck and a woolly hat. I'd always thought they looked good. 
New York Dockers on the waterfront, all that stuff, you know. And um, that's what it was, really. It's more than a band. A band would not be a word that would describe it adequately. Uh, you know, a tribe would be a better word, a small tribe. And so the importance was, you know, to be together, to be around, you know, to put yourselves around town, whatever, en masse, as a tribe, whether or not, you know, you needed to be there for any particular reason. The Dexys tribe's code of conduct was strictly enforced by Roland and Archer. The idea is, is not to drink before we go on stage. No drink, no drugs before we go on stage. We want to be different, you know, this is the idea. All these other groups are making the mistake of doing this, so let's not do it. Now at first, when we, when we tried a couple of uh, session musicians, they would like start drinking halves, beer, something like that before they went on, and we stopped it straight away, we threw them out the band. People did sometimes comment about the rigidity, but there was also quite a lot of fun as well, you know, we'd kind of, um go on shoplifting expeditions if we needed something, you know. And some of the people had never done that before in their lives, you know, whereas <laughs> I was more of an expert at it. There was a feeling that nothing really would, would, was going to stand in our way. Distance was no object. None of us owned a car or anything like that. And we were going up and down to London chasing gigs or chasing record companies. And, I mean, we used to bunk the trains everywhere. That's one thing that was just hilarious, really. I mean, it's, it was very frightening. But it was, uh, you know, if we wanted to go to London, we'd just go to London. And we'd get on the trains and bunk the trains. It was part of the whole Dexys thing was bunking the trains. What we used to do on the trains, if you went into the toilet and left the door on vacant, and then just stood where the door opens against you, all the inspector would do would push the door open to see if you're in, no one was in there, and then he'd walk off, and then he'd walk down the length of the train, then you just went back to a part where he'd already taken tickets. I remember one time, the guy just pushed the door, and then he noticed uh, that, you know, somebody was there, Kevin was there. And he comes in, he goes, right, I've got you, you know, you've got to pay. And Kevin said, he says, you know, that was really below the belt, you're not playing the game. Quite early on, and before the release of, um, of Dance Dance, Kevin broached the idea of forming a nucleus. There would be a nucleus, and there would be other people outside the nucleus, and that uh, people could come into that nucleus when and when they developed ideas and contrib contributed to the idea of Dexys Midnight Runners. From what I understand, that, that's why there were only three people that were signed to EMI. It was suggested to me and to... I think Kevin Archer, maybe, that um, when I look back, you know, I think, oh, God, you know. But it was suggested to me that um, because there was eight of us, um, you know, there wouldn't be that much money so that we should have a nucleus, you know. And I wasn't happy about it. Um, those by the group's advisors suggested that. Um, it didn't feel great, but I did it, you know. I don't know why EMI just signed up three people. I don't know how it managed to get to that stage. All I do know is that it's, uh, it was very confusing at the time. I just felt a bit... I felt like there was, there was already a split happening. But the divisive hierarchical structure of the band didn't prevent the newly signed Dexys from storming to number one in the charts with their second single, Gino. It was about, you know, Washington, the soul singer in the 60s, and the way he used to play around, you know, in uh, venues and kind of really get intense and that kind of thing and preach soul music. And it was the way he was a brilliant entertainer and, and there was a sadness to it as well, whereas he was doing all this and he was kind of nowhere, really. He was kind of melancholic, which Kevin does a lot with lyrics.
I think it still holds up today. It's got, you can still hear the, 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 uh, the sort of attitude and the power of it, you know, and it still sounds unusual, you know. Uh, you know, it's got its own personality, but within the, you know, the influence of, of, of soul, of soul music. I mean, I knew I was arrogant. I knew that, I, and I felt, with some justification, that yeah, we should be number one. As is good enough. To, we are good enough. That is song. Gino is good enough to be number one. But the anger was definitely driving me. The anger was driving me, and that was going to drive us. Come on, we'll succeed. We're going to do this. Fuck them. Fuck everybody. And everybody was the enemy. Enemy number one was his record company. Kevin thought they were creaming off too much money from the band. So while recording their debut album, Searching for the Young Soul Rebels, he put to use Stexy's finely tuned shoplifting abilities. If they didn't renegotiate, then we were gonna, we were gonna take our LP, our work, which of course they laughed at and then didn't believe that we'd do it. You know, oh, come on, this is EMI. You're just joking, you don't do that, this is EMI. And we said, we're gonna do it, we'll do it. It was like the final wrap up of the final mixes. Pete Wingfield produced the album, did an excellent job, by the way. So um, we're just finishing off, everything is finished. He goes out to get a cup of coffee, and then we quickly slam the door to the control room, lock the door, everybody's standing point. And at a given signal, which I think it may have been Steve Spooner coughing, <coughs> all hell broke loose. We all knew exactly what we had to do. There was about six or seven two-inch two cartons of magnetic tape. So everybody grabbed uh, tape and run through this maze of uh, corridors that's in Chipping North. The keyboard player at the time had a girlfriend named Maddie, I remember, with a Morris Minor. And she was stationed outside, ready for the getaway. Jeff was the driver. He left the, the van waiting, revved up. And the road, he was revving his engine and going backwards and forwards. And we were off. We were, we were away. And sure enough, we rushed out and jumped in the Morris Minor and disappeared. Mm. We just thought, what did we do that for, you know? <laughs> we, thought, we thought it was going so well. <laughs> and I sort of dived in the back of the van and just sort of took off, heading towards Birmingham with police cars chasing us. Getting chased by a police car up the A40 at 90 miles an hour was not my idea of fun. They sent the chairman of the record company up to speak to us because we still toured in that and he announced that we got more points than before and so it solved the problem really. Yeah, we took the record company on, the producer, you know, what was I going to be angry about now? Enemy number two, the music press. On the release of Searching for the Young Soul Rebels, these days considered one of the most influential albums of the 80s, Roland boycotted the journalists, instead communicating directly to the fans through full-page adverts. I remember him always talking in his sleep, you know, and it was always like, uh, fucking, fucking, you know, swearing, and he was always upset in his sleep. He was angry about something. He was often angry at the group. I used to wear a red hat, and he used to say, uh, you can't wear that red hat. And he would send somebody up to me, you know, say, you got to, you got to take the hat off, you know. I say, well, why? Kevin's orders, like this. And he would insist that I took the hat off. And it was a bit like the Abbott and Costello Susquehanna hat company kind of sketch, and it was a, you're not wearing that, you're, and it was a bit like uh, this going on. It was screaming at each other just before we went on stage, and there were a